Hi, I'm Cray with the International Water Training Institute. On behalf of the Australian Water School, welcome to today's webinar on QGIS Essentials for Water Modeling. Now, today we're talking about geospatial tools. So let's have a quick look at the phenomenal geospatial spread of our attendees today. We've got almost 2,000 from over 100 countries. We've mapped uh, where you are in the world with this map here, but today we're going to learn more about how to map out what matters most in your own world. Today's experts, you've got, uh, we've got Hans, we've got Kurt, and we've got Phil, um, all of whom are very familiar faces on the water school. Um, if the three of you, um, or I think uh, Phil may be helping in the background, but uh, Hans and Kurt, at least, uh, if you can turn on your cameras. And uh, let's have a little bit of an introduction. Um, you are familiar faces to us, but uh, some of us, uh, some people might be uh, tuning in uh, as well um, for the first time here and uh, meeting you for the first time. Ah, Phil, we've got you online as well. That's great. Um, if each of you could just kind of introduce yourselves, tell us where you're coming to us from. I know it's bright and early in uh, Europe at the moment, so thanks for putting the cameras on. Um, and uh, we'll also have a look at the poll results in the background while you come on and introduce yourself. So let us know how you, how's your new year shaping up? Um, how's your 2023 been so far? Let's start with you, Hans. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning here in, uh, in the Netherlands. It's around uh, six o'clock in the morning, so quite early. Happy to be here again uh, with the Australian Water School and all of you. Um, the year has been... Uh, very nice until now, doing lots of uh, GIS activities. We started a new uh, master's uh, uh, at IHE Delft, so lots of new students uh, getting acquainted with uh, QGIS for hydrological applications. Excellent. Um, and Kurt, over to you. Hi, I'm uh, joining from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. And uh, again, it's 6 a.m. here as well. And uh, the year's off to a good start, teaching lots of courses and doing a lot of QGIS consulting for various customers. So. Awesome. Yes. And Phil, um, let us know where you're coming to us from. I think we got both sides of Australia here covered, plus the middle with uh, those administrators on. So, um, yeah, where are you coming to us from today? Uh, yeah, from uh, Victoria in, in Australia, so regional Victoria. So, uh, yeah. and, uh, tell us a little bit about your role with uh, Twoflow and maybe make a little bit of a plug for the webinars that you've got uh, coming up. Uh, yeah, work uh, in the Twoflow development and also, you know, support and, and, and training. So, yeah, we're, we're very busy um, trying to get a, a release out the door for, for Twoflow. Um, but also, yeah, we do have some upcoming webinars, um, an introduction to, to Twoflow modeling um, coming up soon, I think. Uh, but I'll try and take a, a role in the background and just be on the Q&A line. <laughs> so you don't have to see my face. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks to uh, everybody for joining us today. Um, we'll bring our speakers back on momentarily, um, but I wanted to set uh, some things up in context uh, a little bit first. Um, before we dive into the presentations, um, we are the water school, and so uh, one of the things, uh, you know, why why do we get into GIS at all? You know, shouldn't we just leave mapping to the uh, GIS experts and uh, let us water people just keep doing hydrology and hydraulics? Um, well, by its very nature, uh, water is geospatial, and every drop of it has a place in space on our blue planet, and even here, as you see on some models that we've done here, on the red planet as well. Um, and a hydrologist who by definition, studies water will invariably end up serving a dual role as a practicing geospatialist, if we can make up a new job title. And a key element of any hydrological science will be an understanding of the distribution of water. We map where it is, where it's been, and where it's going. And we here at the Water School believe that communicating that uh, distribution effectively will help you stand out in your field. So whether you're entirely new to GIS or using previous experience on the GIS, uh, QGIS platform, um, today's webinar, uh, we're hoping it will provide you with some time-saving tools and indispensable uh, tools that make you more efficient in your work and will help you make your work shine. I've set up um, in the background an accompanying web page. It's uh, at hydroschool.org slash QGIS. And on that website, I've compiled some of our previous uh, QGIS resources. So to frame this one up, this is our fourth uh, webinar covering QGIS. And on this web page, you'll find links to our three previous uh, QGIS recordings. So part one, uh, we had a look at some raster calculator tools, got a demo of some visualization tools. In part two, we stepped through some centroid tools and then applied the plugins to generate a catchment or a watershed map, like you see here. And then in part three, we used the same QGIS tools and applied them to groundwater. 
So we're excited to bring you part four today, which builds on all of the previous webinars with some new plugins. And this all leads into a live course next month, which will include links uh, to here and in the interactive courses that you'll see, um, you can get to start from scratch and end up with some really cool looking maps like you see here. Um, we also wanted to plug this book here that our presenters today have authored along with some screenshots um, that you see here um, that show you some of the maps that you'll get to make if you step through the tutorials in that book and in the other water school courses. With that uh, introduction, we look forward to what you have to offer us today. Thanks, Cree. Um, so uh, I'll just start with a little uh, introductory uh, presentation to uh, to set the scene, and then we'll head off with a, a live demonstration of, uh, of a few tools. Um, so I'm Hans van der Krost. Uh, I work at IHE Delft. Um, I'm an associate professor of open science and digital innovation. Um, I did my PhD at Utrecht University uh, in the Netherlands uh, on the integration of remote sensing and soil moisture modeling. And uh, after that, I was a researcher at the Flemish Institute for Technological Research. And uh, in those days, already started working with uh, open source GIS tools. Um, nowadays, I'm also a board member of the Dutch QGIS user group. And uh, I'm an owner of uh, Quas GIS. Uh, it's my own consultancy for open source uh, GIS consultancy and trainings. And I'm a member of Q Cooperative with uh, other great uh, developers of uh, QGIS. Uh, together with Kurt, of course, you've seen we uh, authored uh, QGIS for hydrological applications, and we have a set the second edition, um, for which I will show a few examples also in uh, today's session. Um, you can also check uh, GIS OpenCourseWare, that's the uh, OpenCourseWare platform, uh, where you can find a lot of free resources also in different uh, languages um, on QGIS, but also on other uh, useful uh, open source tools. So my main interests are, of course, uh, open source uh, GIS and modeling. I'm uh, a QGIS certified instructor, and uh, I'm happy also to uh, to announce that Australian Water School uh, is now also uh, uh, accepted as a QGIS certified organization. So they will uh, bring more for the trainings and also contribute to, um, to QGIS itself with the certification program. I'm interested in uh, remote sensing for hydrology. I work at IHE Delft in the uh, water accounting, water productivity team, and we do a lot with uh, uh, the FAO uh, Vapor uh, database, which is also providing lots of useful data for uh, hydrologists, especially those in, involved in agriculture. And in projects, I work a lot on uh, spatial data infrastructures and uh, advocacy for open data. And I uh, like a lot to be in the field and uh, use uh, also great GIS tools in the field, such as uh, Mergent Maps, uh, for example, that synchronizes well with uh, your QGIS projects. Uh, you can find me on all uh, kind of social media and uh, also have a look at my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I have almost 20,000 subscribers. It would be great that after this webinar, I'll reach 20,000. And I think with a large amount uh, watching now, uh, that should be possible. So in a previous uh, Australian Water School webinar, uh, we have covered the whole stream and catchment delineation uh, procedure. Um, and the nice thing is that this is a generic procedure. So it can be done with many different uh, tools outside and inside QGIS. And uh, in previous courses, we have used uh, Saga as a toolbox, but there are many more toolboxes uh, which you can use for uh, the same approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, tools that are available because QGIS is uh, in fact an integrator of tools and as you can see here is that there's uh, in the processing toolbox uh, lots of tools from grass that you could use uh, for hydrological analysis uh, there's the PC raster tools plugin I'm going to talk more about that that's uh, my own plugin that uh, I implemented with uh, Niall Dawson from uh, North Road Saga that we've uh, been using before uh, which also has great tools and there's also um, the white box tools also a very great uh, uh, tool set runs very smooth and, and fast also in QGIS uh, you can uh, uh, add these to your QGIS using so-called processing provider plugins I'm going to explain that a bit more so there are different plugins. There are uh, core plugins. They come uh, with QGIS. So if you go to the plugins manager, as you see in the animation, and you look at installed, you will see uh, the ones that already uh, come with QGIS. You don't need an extra internet connection to install them. You can activate them by checking the box. 
uh, but many other plugins need to be installed to the plugins uh, manager and you need an internet connection to get it from a repository. Those are the third party plugins and um, they can be distinguished in uh, graphical user interface plugins that come with their own uh, panel or uh, uh, dialogue. There are also processing plugins. Those are the ones I showed in the previous slide with uh, the animation. They come with uh, tools in the toolbox and it has some advantages that I'm going to talk about. And uh, there are also uh, experimental plugins. So these processing provider plugins have an advantage that they add uh, algorithms to the processing toolbox and they integrate them with the whole uh, framework. Uh, for processing so they can be used in different places in QGIS also in um, building the graphical models like you see in the example on the right which uh, calculates the height above the nearest drainage a relative DEM um, and you can use it for batch processing and in fact it creates uh, Python classes so you can also integrate it in your PyQGIS uh, scripts uh, and these um, tools are also able to add um, uh, if you install them as a plugin also uh, add menu items um, and then you might ask the question why we uh, switched from Saga to PC Raster in the second edition uh, well we like Saga uh, a lot um, and uh, it's certainly good in uh, in the job of uh, hydrological analysis but it's also good to show other uh, toolboxes and there has been a bit of a change in thought of these kind of um, uh, processing provider plugins that come from uh, third-party tools um, and you might have noticed a warning uh, when you use uh, Q, uh, use Saga tools in uh, QGIS that the, the version is not officially supported and there are some issues and um, unfortunately with hydrological applications you will run into issues with the default installation that um, <laughs> the key tool to uh, delineate the catchment, the upslope area tool is uh, no longer working and you, you need some workarounds to get it working in uh, QGIS. Um, so the idea was um, by the community to, um, uh, to, to have these uh, processing providers in a separate installation, don't support it as some uh, core um, functionality that is installed with uh, QGIS. So they can be maintained by the owners of, uh, of these processing provider plugins. And um, therefore, since version 3.22, uh, some things have been uh, changed, which you can uh, see here. So you always had Saga and Grass uh, uh, by default installed, and uh, this, this uh, has changed a bit and is going to change a bit more. Um, so, but it gives advantages for the maintenance of these uh, plugins. And there are many nice uh, processing provider plugins uh, like for R and uh, Whitebox, I already mentioned, and uh, there's the new uh, PC Raster Tools plugin. So what you really need to know about these plugins that you need to install first the third party software. It doesn't come with QGIS, so you need to install it separately and then install the plugin. So most of the emails I get about PC Raster is that uh, uh, they get the message it's not installed and it gives uh, errors, which we made human readable, but still it means you need to install the software and then install the plugin. And you can find easily in the documentation of um, um, the plugin, um, I will show it in a bit, uh, how to do that. So all these plugins, they come with a link to the documentation and uh, it's very important to read that. It's not always that it works out of the box. Sometimes you need to also install uh, Python packages. And then in QJS, sometimes you need to uh, do some extra steps to configure the toolbox in the processing toolbox. So I'm almost uh, starting with the, the demo. Um, and the demo that I'm going to show you is just highlighting a few of these tools from the PC Raster Tools plugin. And we start with a DEM uh, downloaded for um, an area in uh, Australia, the Gold Creek uh, catchment uh, that we used in previous, uh, or that we use in the trainings for the Australian uh, Water School. And um, there are here two nice plugins that you can use to download uh, DEMs from all over the world. Um, there is the SRTM downloader plugin, which downloads uh, SRTM tiles, uh, but it's also nice to have a look at the open topography DM downloader plugin, which gives you access to these eight different uh, DEMs at different resolutions. Um, and it stitches the tiles nicely together to the area, uh, to the extent that you define. Um, and uh, here you see uh, the interface, the open topography DM downloader plugin. You can simply choose uh, the DM you want to download. And um, this is where uh, the demo will start. I'll start uh, sharing uh, 
QGIS here. So I've downloaded uh, the DEM from uh, the uh, Open Topography DEM downloader plugin. And when you download a DM, it's of course not styled it, it, to make it a bit nicer here in the demo. Uh, but if you download a DM, you, you can hover your mouse always over layers to see uh, the projection and where it's stored. And we see here that uh, downloaded DM has a EPSG of 4326, which means it's in a geographic coordinate system. And uh, you can't use that for uh, DM analysis. Uh, because uh, the Z units are in meters and your X and Y units in this case are in latitude, longitude. Um, so many tools will run but give wrong results because they assume that the, the units are the same. So what I'm going to do is uh, first do a reprojection before we start uh, demonstrating other things. So I do that with um, projections and then warp. And it's here the input and I choose a target and we use here UTM, which I already set before. So it's a project uh, CRS, which you can also see at the bottom right. That's the on the fly reprojection. Uh, I keep the default resampling in this case. I change the no data value to minus 9999. That's an out of range value. And I set the resolution to 30 meters. And that's uh, the the product that we use approximately 30 meters on the equator. And then I uh, save it to a file and uh, make sure you choose here GeoTIFF. It remembers the last setting that you've used. I've been playing around with PC Raster. So I call this uh, DM, uh, uh, UTM. Yeah. And this will produce a GeoTIFF, so a copy of the DM in GeoTIFF uh, format. And uh, now I want to further process this using the PC Raster Tools plugin. So I've already installed the plugin, but let me quickly show you. If you go to the Plugins Manager and you look for PC Raster, then uh, you find a description. And what I said is always important to um, check here in the by, uh, if you install plugin the homepage, uh, which will give you instructions on uh, how to install it and um, also point you to other resources. So it's useful to check that out before you use. Uh, a plugin. PC Raster has been developed by Utrecht University um, and um, has a Python library. So all the tools that you can uh, find here through the plugin, um, especially for hydrology is important for you, uh, is what you can also use as uh, Python functions. So what I'm first going to do is uh, convert it to the PC Raster format because you need to do that. And this uses uh, GDAL in the back end. So we have our DM in UTM and PC raster is very strict in uh, data types. So uh, Boolean uh, means the raster is zero or one, nominal it's classes, ordinal means there's an order in classes and scalar means that it's, uh, um, uh, that it's decimal numbers, uh, continuous data and there's some other data types here. So it's a scalar, I'm going to save it and I call this one uh, just DM. That's the DM we're going to work with. And it runs a GDAL and has converted it now another copy uh, of our DM. And um, the next step that I'm going to do is to calculate um, the flow direction. So in many other uh, workflows, uh, there's two steps needed. You need to uh, correct your DM for uh, filling the sinks and uh, then produce uh, the flow direction. Uh, with PC Raster, you can do both in uh, one step. So with the LDD create tool, and here on the right, you always find uh, the, the link to the official documentation and the description of the inputs. Uh, this will fill the sinks in the DEM, but also um, create the flow direction map directly. If you want the corrected DEM, you choose the LDD create DEM tool. So I'm just going to run this with the default settings. Um, you can check in the documentation that you have many uh, parameters that you can uh, adjust here to control the filling algorithm, which is an advantage of uh, using PC raster tools. So I'm going to call this one flow direction. And uh, here we have uh, the result of the, the flow direction. And uh, it makes more sense to look at it with uh, arrows. So I've installed the Crayfish plugin developed by Lutra Consulting. And if you go here to conversions, 
then uh, you find here uh, two nice tools to convert flow direction from PC Rust or Saga to a mesh format. So we can use the mesh styling properties of uh, QGIS. So I'm going to convert this flow direction map, uh, which is in the PC Ruster LDD, local drain direction format, to a grip file. And I save the result and I call this uh, flow gear mesh. And output is a grip file. <clears throat> it uses MDAL and here it's converted. And then here in the browser, I can find here the grip file. Make sure that you use the layer with the mesh icon. I'm going to add it here to um, the map canvas. And if it shows up yellow, it means it's correct because we need to still style it. So I go to the layer styling panel and you see it's adjusted to the mesh. I go here to the first tab and you might need to extend your uh, styling panel a bit to see these two buttons. I often get questions about that. So I'm going to remove the uh, colors here by unchecking the contour icon and I'm going to activate arrows. And then I need to still tune um, how the arrows uh, look like. And what I do first is uh, use a fixed length and uh, make it a bit smaller. And when I zoom in, I see here the flow directions. Um, I can change the, the color uh, to uh, something uh, more uh, related to water, a bit uh, bluish. And what you can also do is uh, you can uh, display it on a grid. So it, uh, the arrows, they will snap on, uh, on a grid that you uh, define here. And this really shows nicely the direction of flows. You can also use uh, streamlines that will uh, generate streamlines here or you can use uh, traces and uh, you can change all kinds of settings related to that uh, here. Let's switch it back to arrows. Um, and uh, this also works nicely in the 3D view. So what I'm going to do is uh, use OpenStreetMap in the, in the background, remove the layers in between. And uh, if I go here to view 3D map, then I can set it up here, configure. And what's important in the 3D view is uh, to uh, indicate where your elevations come from. And I'm going to use here, you can use DM, UTM, or DM, that doesn't matter as long as they are in the correct projection. And I'm going to increase here the tile resolution a bit so we see some more details. And I do okay. And then when I turn it around, you can, of course, tweak uh, the settings of the, the arrows a bit more. But here you see what it does, and we can interpret, uh, interpret the water flow in the, in the landscape. And it also works live if I change it, for example, to uh, streamlines. Here it is. OK, I'm going to show a few uh, more things. So what you can do is, um, and let's put our uh, uh, flow direction here uh, back. When you have this, you can apply all kinds of other hydrological tools of uh, PC rasters, such as uh, calculating the stream order. And it needs as an input the flow direction map, the local drain direction map uh, in the PC raster format. And then I save it here and I call this uh, Straler because this will calculate our Straler orders. And uh, here we see the result, and we can style that. Um, this is an ordinal uh, format, so which means that uh, it has uh, classes, the Strahler orders, and the order is important. And then we use palleted unique values to style it. And if we choose here blues and click classify, then we can see here the rivers in the area. And here are all the Strahler orders. And then we can calibrate that to uh, get the rivers out of that. You can also use the uh, flow accumulation method. So here's another tool, AccuFlux. There are many um, other tools with flow accumulation that can you can use to, to model your flow. AccuFlux is the most simple one, which simply uh, accumulates uh, material uh, using the flow direction. But if you want to have um, um, infiltration and, um, and those things, 
um, simulated, you can use these uh, these other tools here. So I'm going to use Aquaflux, and it says I need a uh, flow direction map, the LDD layer, and I need a material layer. And here's described what it needs to uh, be. So I'm going to create a material layer. And you can do that with the spatial tool. And I use a, a raster which has only value one, which is scalar, because that's what the, the other tool needs. So I give all the pixels in the raster value one. And um, in the flow accumulation, it's going to accumulate then all the ones. So we get a nice uh, flow accumulation map. But you can also use rainfall, and then it will accumulate the rainfall uh, amounts. So here I just call this scalar scalar one, and then I run it. And if your screen is then black, that is correct because every pixel then is a value one. And then I can use this in the Aquaflux function. Go to the flow direction, and the material is scalar one, and then the result is. Uh, flow accumulation and here we see it let me zoom to the layer extent and uh, the values are quite uh, extreme so from one to hundred ten thousand so we need to do a little bit on the styling there it's continuous so single band pseudo color that's a difference with strala orders which is ordinal and um, with the normal uh, scaling we don't see really uh, much um, it's stretching the color. So if I change the min max settings, uh, then for these extreme kind of cases, we need a more logarithmic skill. And if you switch to cumulative count, then here we see um, the flow accumulation um, that we can then also use to derive the river. So there are two methods you can get, uh, you can do the calibration with uh, Strala orders. You say, um, well, let's, let's do that quickly. So this is the one for Strahler order, and you can say in the raster calculator, if uh, Strahler order is a uh, larger or equal to, let's say five, um, there's this nice new create on the fly raster. That's when you're calibrating, you don't want to keep all the intermediate results and just call this Strahler five. And it creates a temporary uh, result. Okay, so I need to uh, style it. Um, this is also with palleted unique values because it is um, Boolean. All the ones larger or equal to five are two and uh, less is uh, zero. Um, so if I click classify, you can see here the results. And if I remove this uh, minus value, which is a no data value, which has been uh, processed here, and I remove the zero, then I can uh, use that in calibration with uh, OpenStreetMap to find how well it corresponds with the rivers on the map. So that's uh, generally uh, what you do. Um, Ray, how much time <laughs> do I have left? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I, I know there are some questions coming in in the background, um, but uh, I guess, uh, yeah, we, we, we could, um, you know, maybe, maybe hit just a couple more. And then um, if, if Kurt has some things to add, um, we'll just make sure. What I did want to make a plug for is that a lot of times what happens on these things when we've got our experts attending live is everybody waits until the last 10 minutes to answer questions or ask questions, and then we don't get a chance to respond. So do get your questions in right now. Anything that you want to hear specifically specifically about get those in and upvote them so that then we can get uh, Hans and Kurt and Phil both on uh, uh, everybody on live to uh, to answer those. So yeah, I, I think we're doing just fine with time. Okay, um, maybe a show uh, then uh, one more thing before we, uh, we go to Kurt. Um, so there are some really nice tools that uh, use this uh, flow direction. For example, there is uh, the downstream tool, which gives you the pixel value uh, downstream. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, find all uh, the junctions here in the uh, Strahler order map. I just need to um, to create from the Strahler order orders here uh, a map with the river. So let's use this uh, larger equal to five. So I again use the spatial tool and use a value five ordinal. So I create a raster with all pixels uh, with value five. And let's save this. And then I call this Strahler. I'm sorry, Ordinal 5. 
So it's ordinal, so it, it needs to match uh, the style orders, uh, run it. And now I can use some of these conditional operators. So I can say if, if the Strahler raster is larger or equal to five, then I call it a river. So I call this a uh, river. And then I get all the um, pixels that have Strahler order larger or equal to five. But then I can also use if then here to say if the river pixels are true, give those pixels back the Strahler orders. So I use a Boolean input, true or false, river, or not river. And I use the Strahler orders to assign that to the true values. And with if then else, you can also indicate what to do with the false pixels. So I'm saving it here and I call this river Strahler. And this adds our Strahler orders back to the river, which means we can also style that again with the palette of unique values. And I'm gonna just give this random color so you see the different Strahler orders. Um, yeah. So this is how it looks like. And now I'm interested to find uh, the junctions. So uh, all the uh, outlets of the tributary. So I could use that to delineate the subcatchments. And there you can use this nice downstream tool. So I go to um, flow direction, needs that as an input. And uh, I use river Strahler. And then let me call this uh, Strahler downstream. And it's exactly the same map, but then with the pixels one downstream. So I'm gonna copy the style and paste it here. And now I can use a condition again. If Strahler is not the same as the Strahler downstream, I'm on a junction. So use here, uh, call it junction. And then uh, I can also uh, style that. And now all these red dots here are junctions, so where the tributaries are. And I can use that uh, then to uh, delineate the subcatchments, but then I need to give them a unique value because they need to be uh, um, unique numbers. And there's a tool for that called uh, Unique ID. I use the search box to find it uh, quicker. So unique ID, uh, but the problem is it results in a scalar and I need a nominal. So I need two more steps. So I'm going to automatically number the junctions. I call this uh, uh, outlet IDs. Okay. So now each has a unique number. So there are 214 outlets in the map, uh, but I need to convert them to nominal. So I go here, PC raster, uh, data management, convert layer data type. So the unique ID outputs a scalar, but I need a nominal to get the subcatchments. So I change this to nominal. And I call this outlets. And I run it. Now I have all the outlets. And then I can use that to delineate all the subcatchments. So let's uh, do that. Uh, it's under hydrology. And there is the function subcatchment. And I use the flow direction layer and the outlets and save that to subcatchments. And then I run it. And there I get all the subcatchments. And uh, let's use palette unique styling with random colors. And there we have the subcatchments in this area. So there was a quick way to find all the subcatchments that uh, belong to a certain Strahla order. That's awesome. So, uh, yeah. Um, no, so that nice if, if, 
Yeah, it, it, it certainly looks like it. Um, and, uh, you know, th these are some very useful tools. Uh, what I'd recommend at this point, um, Hans, if you can go on, there's a bunch of questions. Um, I, I know uh, Kurt and Phil have been uh, frantically answering some questions online. If you can have a quick look at those as well, maybe while uh, Kurt uh, presents his bits, and then that way when we come back on, we can go a bit over the time um, as needed. But um, that way, if you've had a look at them, then you can choose which ones you'd like to highlight uh, live. Anything else you wanted to cover in your presentation before we, Kurt, turn it over to Kurt. Uh, no, I think this was it. And we, we can continue with Kurt and I'll answer the questions. Perfect. All right. We'll swap here and then we'll come back on with everybody. So uh, Kurt, if you want to share your screen and then uh, we'll turn it over to you. And thanks for answering all those questions in the background. And thanks, Phil, as well for your time. So I can see that just fine if you want to maximize that. Perfect. There it is. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm going to cover in my part of the presentation how to use some of the symbology and data visualization tools in QGIS to show the results of what Hans was um, showing in the analysis and then how to produce a nice map from the results. Um, so again, I'm uh, based out of Copenhagen, Denmark, and I work for a nice Danish open source company named Septima. And I do a mix of uh, spatial analysis, cartography, and teaching. And I'm a QGIS author. I've written uh, nine books on QGIS. And this last year, I'll show you at the end um, a shameless plug of the, the last two, including the second edition of the QGIS hydrology book that you've heard about. I'm a longtime QGIS user, first downloaded it in 2005, and I've been teaching QGIS since 2009. And I'm an OSGEO charter member. So Hans showed uh, the nicely styled um, digital elevation model. But of course, when you first bring that into a software like QGIS, it's going to just be styled on a um, black to white color ramp st stretched between the values on the, on the, in the raster, the elevation values. And so we can um, certainly use a nice color ramp using that single band pseudo color renderer to make a, a color DEM. And then we can also use some tools to in QGIS to create a nice color hill shade image. So this gets into using blending modes and I'll kind of show how this procedure works. QGIS um, incorporates blending modes that are used in other graphic software and you can do some nice things with them to render data. So here we have the Gold Creek DEM and I'm gonna open up the layer styling panel and I'm gonna change the rendering for this from the single band gray which is the default to single band pseudo color, which allows me to apply a nice color ramp to this. And there are some nice terrain based color ramps that you can access in QGIS. Now I'm going to duplicate that layer, make another copy of it and move this copy above the color DEM in the QGIS layers panel. And I'm gonna change the rendering for this uh, copy from single band pseudo color to hill shade. So I get a nice hill shade of this Gold Creek area. Now I can incorporate a blending mode to this uppermost hill shade rendered layer. And I'm gonna use one from this darken group, the, the multiply blending mode. And instantaneously, I get a nice rendering of showing the full saturation of the colors in the color DEM and all the detail in the hill shade. So from that point, now that I have this nicely rendered colored hill shade, I can use another renderer in QGIS. So I'm gonna duplicate and make a third copy of this um, elevation data. And this time I'm gonna use the contour renderer. So you can see in QGIS, I can quickly use some of the built-in renderers to create some really nicely styled terrain. So with the, the contour renderer, you can set up index contours with a slightly thicker line. And I can try a different blending mode on those, such as overlay or soft light, which is going to basically cause the contour to take on a more saturated color of whatever color in the DEM that contour line is running through, and it creates a very nice effect. So just with a few clicks, you can, in QGIS, make a, a beautiful map from just a raw DEM. After the analysis, um, we have the, the main catchment that was identified, and we have the, uh, the, the channels with the strailer order. 
So we can style those by Strailer order. So this is simply using the graduated renderer in QGIS, and we have the, the order column, and we're just classifying them from thin to thick lines based on the Strailer order. Um, in the course, we're also going to show you how to use a different um, symbol layer type that's come out in the last uh, year and a half in QGIS called interpolated lines would allow, allow you to actually fade those um, Strailer order lines out to fine points and, and not have this um, kind of more coarse um, from thick to thin look. You can actually render them in a more naturalistic way using that renderer. Next, we're going to look at the um, a nice trick you can use in QGIS. So we can use um, on this catchment an inverted polygon renderer. So you can see here I'm, I'm styling this with inverted polygons, and that basically inverts this data so that it, you're only seeing everything beyond the catchment. And I can use this as basically a mask to highlight the study area. So I can use that in combination with a shape burst fill symbol layer type and fade that um, symbol layer type from um, black to white with a certain set distance. And I can then um, have this beautiful effect where I have the kind of the, the catchment kind of popping off the map. The rest of the landscape is still there because I'm using some transparency on this mask uh, that was created with inverted polygons. But the inverted polygon shape burst fill is a great technique cartographically to show the, the catchment of a watershed analysis. So this brings us to the QGIS print composer, which in, when you're going to design a map for a publication or to show the results of an analysis, it opens up as a separate window. There's tools along the left-hand side for adding different map elements, such as the map, which I've just added here. You can then via item properties, set the properties of that map, for example, the scale, and use some tools to center the map in the composition. And then we need to add um, other elements to our map composition to, to make a nice looking map. So this is the toolbar on the left that allows you to add different map elements to QGIS. I'm just showing some of the elements that we might wanna add here, um, for example, the text tool can be used to add a, a nice title to the map. There's a, an add legend tool, which can be used to add a map legend. And just out of the box, you're going to get um, a rectangle patch for the catchment and straight lines for the trailer streams. Um, but we can enhance that as well. QGIS has a style manager. And this is, I think, an overlooked feature of QGIS. Um, this is a place where you can manage all the styles for points, lines, polygons, um, color ramps for rasters. You can tag your styles. So for example, you could have a terrain tag so that I can see all the terrain tagged color ramps. You can store text formats, label settings, and then finally at the right-hand side, legend patch shapes. So QGIS doesn't come with any legend patch shapes, but there um, is a way to import from a QGIS repository legend patch shapes. And when added to the map, these make a much more intuitive um, output. You can even create custom legend patch shapes, um, which we'll also show you how to do. You simply copy the geometry of a feature and paste it into that expression box that just said was popped up, and you can um, create a custom um, legend patch shape from one of the features on the map. So in this example, I have set up some custom custom legend patch shapes, and you'll notice that the Gold Creek catchment legend patch is the actual Gold Creek catchment geometry. So I've simply taken that geometry and uh, created a legend patch shape from it so that I can really intuitively show that on the map, and then used some, um, some of the stream legend patch shapes from the public QGIS repository to give a nice intuitive rendering of the Strailer order streams in this Gold Creek watershed. So uh, we also cover in the course 
things that you can learn about the, the different other map elements. So for example, um, the scale bar, which basically allows the map reader to judge distances. And so we'll show you how to set that up. Um, a north arrow, which just you know indicates where north is. And if you've done any rotation to a map, um, you should certainly include the north arrow so that the map reader knows where north is, obviously. Um, there's also um, capabilities in QGIS for giving a nice um, rendering of the, the elevation, the color ramp um, legend. So uh, we're going to show you how to create a, a nice legend for elevation like this. And I've also centered the, the legend here on the map because we also want to add some other things such as credits and date. So um, here this has actually been created using some expressions um, to create smarter auto updating text, for example, using an expression for the date that allows every time you open up this print composition, the date to automatically be updated. So as you go through iterations of the map, you don't have to worry about updating the date. It happens automatically. And another way we can really enhance the map is um, by using map themes. So here in the main QGIS window, um, the little eye icon in the layers panel gives you access to map themes. And so here I've set up a map theme for the main map and one for an inset locator map for the print composition. So from the drop down for map themes, you'll see any map themes that you've created and you can just toggle those. They basically define which layers in your project participate in a given map. So I have a subset for the Australia um, overview and then a subset for the Gold Creek watershed. And so where that comes into play is in the map, I can add a second map to my print composition and I can tell QGIS that I want this map to be defined by the locator map, map theme, whereas the main map is controlled by the Gold Creek catchment map theme. And so I have two different maps with different layers and I can add an overview to the um, Australia locator map with um, style a red point that indicates the location of the Gold Creek catchment. So now map readers have a really clear picture of both the results of the analysis, where this was in Australia and um, really intuitive legend patch shapes for um, delineating what, what, what they're seeing on the map. We can also, as Hans showed with the flow direction, bring this data into 3D. So here we have the 3D viewer open showing the final results of the analysis. And um, so we can rotate this view around and view it from different perspectives. You can even create keyframes in here and then export a series of still images and stitch those together into an animation uh, such as an MP4 or uh, an animated GIF. And uh, we can um, you know, control the, the speed and, and things like that using software such as FFmpeg or um, the open source graphic software GIMP to create the final animation from the series of exported still images. Okay, so that's, uh, I have one shameless plug to finish up, which is simply that um, you've heard a lot about the QGIS for Hydrological Applications second edition here, which was published last May and is current to QGIS 322. So this is a fantastic resource and shows the whole workflow that Hans delineated using PC Raster and all the styling tips that we've shown along the way. And the book on the right, Discover QGIS 3X, the second edition was published just last August. This is a much um, broader treatment of all the capabilities in QGIS. It's not specifically focused on hydrology, um, but it gives a broad treatment of all the various tools in QGIS, including using weather mesh data that you see on the cover. Okay, thank you very much.
Awesome. Okay, I think that's 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 as much as much as you can cram into one hour there. And again, you've you've watched some masters at work here. Um, you know, you, I, I use my concert analogies, and if you go to a concert and people are lip syncing, um, you know they're not very confident. But uh, here, Hans and Kurt have been performing live for you. Um, you know, sometimes that works. Sometimes there's some hangups and glitches with the computer, but it, uh, they they did a phenomenal job. Uh, and you'll have the link to this recording. So if you want to follow along, you can stop. You can pause. Um, you can go back through and uh and have a look at what they've done um do uh if 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 you uh have the chance um sign up next month for the course where you'll get to do this on your own we'll provide you with the terrain data um that in that case uh, we're using actually publicly available uh australian uh data that um is available to everyone uh to to download for free uh and then we'll step you through how to make exactly those kinds of maps now um it, that that course uh, starts on the 14th of March, and you'll get to uh, again back to my analogies backstage passes with Kurt and uh, and Hans to work through this uh, on your own, and so you know you'll, you'll you'll get to to come up with these yourself. And so you can see on the screen um, where you can go to register for that um, if you'd like to try this on your own. Uh, but we certainly appreciate having seen uh, some of these latest tools um, and how the, how some of these things work, um, including you know if you've gone back and watched some of the earlier recordings or even took the earlier course there are some brand new tools out there that make things a lot handier so three sessions uh coming up um it'll, a little later in the day on sydney time but that makes it bright and early in europe um and so uh that the, the, this is one that um, i highly recommend uh, you take advantage of if you're in the u.s and stuck with the wee hours uh or somewhere else on the planet um you can still sign up for the course and watch the recordings um live so uh hans and kurt if you can take a look back through the things you've answered and uh, maybe uh, uh, have a couple in mind i, I have a question for phil actually um uh if uh, just as a as an end user as you're watching this happen i mean these look very handy especially downloading some of the srtm data and the things that are free repositories uh anything you want to mention about the pitfalls of potentially using some of this uh, publicly available uh, uh satellite-based data not for hydrology but for hydraulics if you've ever seen that go into like a rain on grid model i saw some of the banding on there that's even affecting some of the flow paths anything you wanted to say about um some potential pitfalls uh on on the terrain data that might be available to everyone. Up, oh, muted. Absolutely, yeah. spot on, Gray. Uh, yeah, just be careful with with I guess with any data, um, just to make sure that it's it's fit for purpose. Um, you know, certainly with the SRTM data being relatively, you know, coarse, um, both horizontal and um, vertical resolution. Um, you know, accuracy it, it um, can be limited to, for its use in some applications. Excellent. Well, I appreciate in the background all of your uh, very practical responses there to some of the, you know, from a practitioner standpoint and a modeler standpoint. Um, uh, th thanks for those responses. Uh, let's go back now first to uh, Kurt and then to Hans. Um, Kurt, you want to just pick a couple of the things that you've responded to that you think might be of most benefit to the wider community here, understanding that um, those watching the YouTube recording will not have seen uh, the chat line and, and the 40 or 50 questions that have already come, come through there. Uh, maybe just restate the question and answer as you've put it there. Yeah, I just answered a question on uh, on the book, which was, um, what is there a big difference between the first and second edition of QDIS for hydrological applications? And there, in fact, is. The second edition um, has some very important updates, such as um, the whole hydrological analysis um, has been ported from using Saga tools to the PC raster tools that Hans just showed. So that um, with the incom incompatibility issues with Saga and QGIS, um, the, the PC raster tools provide a much nicer workflow that Hans just uh, showed you a lot of. Um, and the book is also updated to QGIS 322. And so as QGIS rapidly evolves, it's really important to keep um, uh, books like this updated. So this one has all the latest tools that uh, QGIS has to offer, um, including some styling tools as well. Excellent. So we're, we are going to run a few minutes over here if, uh, if you're all right staying on. If you do need to run, um, then tune in for the end of this uh, session. A very valuable uh, feedback. I think we've got a lot of uh, upvoted comments. Um, so if you do need to run, go ahead, but uh, do tune in for some of these answers. Um, Hans, if we can keep you on for just a couple more minutes um, and, and, and uh, have you answer a couple more of these questions, uh, let us know what you think uh, would be the most valuable for the group uh, from the responses that you've already put in there. Uh, many questions are on uh, struggles with uh, installing the PC Raster Tools plugin, and uh, I think it's really important that you check the beginning of uh, the, of my presentation on that. It's very important with any plugin that you install to follow the instructions, 
uh, these processing providers uh, plugins also for setting up white box tools they have specific instructions and uh, on my youtube channel there are troubleshooting uh, videos so the most common problems um, they occur when you have multiple versions of QJS and you you add it to one installation but it's not in the other those are common issues um, yeah Great. Uh, one of the questions that came up again, what we've seen here in most of the examples that we show in the book and on the website and in the course, uh, most of the examples are these natural catchments. Um, Kurt, uh, any suggestions um, on uh, you know adaptations or additional plugins? How would you apply this to an urban environment? I, I imagine that would come with some complexities. Yeah, I'm sure Hans has some input into this as well, but an urban environment um, obviously, hydrologically ha is, is uh, not natural anymore. There, there's you know human constructed channels. Um, the the landscape has been altered with berms and fill ins and things like that. So it it um, some of these hydrological analyses don't often um, give great results when the environment has been modified to that effect. Um, yeah. So it, it offers some some real challenges. You want to add anything to that, Hans? Yeah, it, it's indeed correct what Kurt says. Um, it can be used for urban applications, uh, but be be aware of the limitations. Uh, for example, uh, the tools have been used to to calculate the amount, uh, the, the catchment areas of uh, um, uh, of collectors of the sewage system in urban areas. I've seen that, uh, so that that works. But that's specific case where you you route the water, but you need to do a lot of corrections, and you work at such a detailed uh, level that uh, your DEM uh, also needs to be uh, very uh, precise and you need to think if you need a digital surface model or a digital terrain model for your application. Yeah. Um, Phil, do you want to comment on that as well then? Just talking about uh, maybe a little bit about the, the QJS plugin for TwoFlow and maybe some of the value, you know, um, Hans and Kurt both mentioned that it's a challenge to use some of the hydrological tools within QGIS uh, specifically for an urban environment or a storm drain network. But still, there are a lot of valuable tools within QGIS that would be used in the pre-processing where the other software can take over. You still have a lot of things that you can do with buildings and shape files and things like that that do have some valuable uh, uh, functionality within QGIS. Anything you want to say about that, Phil? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, modeling that area in, in urban areas, highly urbanized areas is, is tricky because there's, there's a lot of complexity in there. We are seeing, uh, certainly seeing direct rainfall type modeling being used used for that. Uh, and some of the tools, are, you know, obviously the pre-processing tools and things like that, uh, either via plugins or the core QGIS um, functionality really help to, to get your more, um, data ready for, for input into a into a model such as that. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, what we'll do here, we've, uh, we're right on the hour, but um, you know, I don't want to cut it off right now because there are a couple of other questions. We we'll, might go another five, five, 10 minutes or here just to, just to make sure that um, uh, everybody gets a chance to maybe sum up a couple of the, the, the final um, uh, comments that you might have made and the responses that you've offered. Uh, so let's go back through in order again, uh, Kurt, then Hans, then Phil, um, cl closing remarks and um, you know, final uh, responses that you wanted to highlight. Um, well, I, I see a question here on interpolation tools, and I just will point out quickly that there is an interpolation toolbox within QGIS with native interpolation tools. There's also a lot of interpolation tools in the toolbox from providers like um, Google and white box tools and, and all the others. So there's a, a full suite of interpolation tools that you can use to create a raster surface from points and, and uh, or lines. Um, and I guess I will say that um, just to, everyone should... Uh, Follow on. We're, we're at the point now where we're going to have a new long term release of QGIS in the next month. So everyone should be cognizant that 328 is going to be the next long term release and we keep moving forward. Um, and so there's also going to be a QGIS conference coming up in the Netherlands in April. And so people should uh, Google, Google that and uh, consider joining that. It would be a great event. Sounds good. Uh, Hans? Yeah. I, I would like to stay, share a, a slide on that just to, to show that oh, uh, what's yeah, coming up. Screen. Yep. Let's have a look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, there was also questions about uh, people want to contribute to um, uh, to QGIS. And uh, there's, there's this great event coming up, the QGIS User Conference. We're happy to host that in the Netherlands. Uh, a lot of uh, colleagues here from the QGIS User Group are uh, working on uh, making that a great event. In Sertogenbosch, you know, we have this uh, this thing that uh, the name, the city name on the splash screen needs to be very difficult to pronunciate. So you can watch back uh, this recording. The correct pronunciation is Sertogenbosch. 
Thank you. Um, so it, it will be a user conference with presentations on how all kinds of uh, applications of QGIS, but there's also then the contributor meeting. In the past, that was called the Hackfest, but it brings uh, people together who want to really uh, work on improving QGIS. It can be also the documentation or translations. Uh, what's also coming up is um, the Phosphor-G uh, prison in, in Kosovo. That's the international uh, Phosphor-G conference where a lot of people in the wider uh, OSGO, open source geo world are, and uh, I hope that uh, some of you can also join there. And in the Netherlands, we also have uh, the local uh, Phosphor-G Netherlands in uh, Middelburg. That's the provincial capital of, uh, of Zealand, not New Zealand, which is closer to you, but Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you're around, uh, please join us there. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Um, Phil, uh, maybe uh, just from a practitioners and modelers and developers uh, standpoint, um, try to convince everybody joining us today who has not. Uh, oh, let's have the poll results real quick at the very end. If we could get those up, let's see how many had actually used QGIS and maybe the final message can be um, uh, uh, geared toward those who have not. Um, there are um, some people, uh, the 13% the of people who have not used it before, or those who may have uh, arrived at other software. Um, yeah, just speak to speak to those who may not have uh, taken the dive yet into doing uh, those things themselves and um, you know, make, make, make a plug for uh, developing your skill sets and uh, getting on board with uh, GIS tools like QGIS. Yeah, certainly QGIS, very, very powerful um, uh, you know, uh, application, you know, a huge amount of work that we can get done in there and you've got nothing to lose. The price is right. <laughs> it's free. It's open. Uh, if you fall in love, you can get involved in it. Um, and yeah, thanks to, to Kurt and Hans, uh, very informative. Um, so I guess that's my takeaway. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks to the, the presenters come on here. Um, you know, we this is this is unpaid. Uh, they're volunteers. Um, you come on for free uh, as an industry. Um, and so we certainly appreciate uh, Hans and Kurt's time and Phil's time uh, as well coming on board uh, in light of all the other things you could be spending your time doing today. They're out here sharing with you uh, the water sector, water professionals around the world, thousands of you, um, their knowledge to help us all uh, improve our skill sets and get us more efficient at what we do. So thanks so much for everybody for attending. The recording will come out to you um, through a link uh, to the YouTube channel and you will get a certificate of attendance. And as I understand, um, we uh, are going to be uh, able to offer some certificates going forward to um, uh, you know, official QGIS certificates as well going forward. Uh, stay tuned for that and do let us know uh, what you want to hear more of for the rest of the year. So 14th of March, you see it highlighted there, uh, QGIS Essentials for Water Modeling. This will be an update to everything we've done before and then stay tuned later in the year for some more uh, groundwater QGIS courses as well and have a look at the rest of the offerings as well. Much more to come from TuFlow um, and some really high power modeling presentations along with water quality, groundwater, uh, other courses coming up, all things water. Uh, we want to bring you the most relevant content for your careers. So thanks for spending uh, your uh, the last hour with us here and uh, we appreciate your attendance and look forward to seeing you on future Australian Water School webinars. With that, we'll say goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.